Hey, 221 Youth, hope you're doing great tonight. I'm so excited because we are starting a brand new series called The Greatest Story Ever Told. So for the next few weeks, we're gonna look at why what Jesus did during Easter matters so much to our faith. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, Easter is over. Easter just uh, happened this past weekend, but I want you to still stay with me because for a lot of people, Easter is just a holiday. But listen, it is so much more. Some of us, if not most of us, know some of the stories in the Bible, like Jonah and the well, Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, even Jesus walking on water and Jesus dying on the cross and then coming back to life like we celebrated this past weekend. But not many of us know the whole story of Scripture, and that's tragic because on their own, those stories can be powerful and life-changing. But when you understand the whole story, the backstory and the history of the Bible, it gives a whole new level of meaning and significance to these stories. Let me give you an example of the importance of a backstory. Back in 1980, a Japanese company called Nintendo, you might have heard of it, came out with an arcade game called Raiderscope. Now, have you ever seen or played the game Space Invaders? If you're old enough, it looked a lot like that. Now, Raiderscope quickly became Nintendo's biggest game of the year in Japan, and Nintendo looked to expand into America. So Nintendo of America decided to go all in on Raiderscope and started manufacturing thousands of cabinets and shipping them from Japan to a warehouse in New Jersey. Now they were able to pre-sell about a thousand of these games, but 2,000 more remained in that New Jersey warehouse collecting dust. Like nobody was biting, nobody was buying these video games. When they realized that Raider Scope wasn't going to sell anymore in America, they began promising a brand new smash hit. So here was Nintendo of America with 2,000 useless video game consoles and a promise to deliver a smash hit that nobody had developed yet. So they began to announce an internal competition and received several ideas from a young employee who had no video game experience. Now he took a basic story of a guy trying to rescue a girl from an evil villain and the villain would be a giant gorilla. They began to create a story. It started with a common plumber who saves a girl from an evil villain. Now the little plumber with the mission of rescuing the girl was known as Jumpman and was given the name Mario. Now the evil villain holding the girl hostage would be a giant gorilla and the game would be called Donkey Kong. The hero from Donkey Kong would go on to star in several other games. And you might've heard this one, Super Mario Brothers, which ended up being Nintendo's biggest selling video game ever. Now, why do I tell you that? Because when you know the whole story, the rest of the story has a lot more meaning. You may not play Super Mario Brothers the same anymore. Now you know how it started. So listen, so because of that, because of the importance of a backstory, we are going to spend the next few weeks exploring the whole story of scripture and why it's the greatest story ever told and why what took place at Easter mattered so much and that we don't forget about it until next year. So let's jump in to the greatest story ever told part one. And tonight's message is called Rebellion. Now that'll make a little bit more sense as we get into the talk tonight. So we're going to start right at the beginning, Genesis chapter one. Now in this first chapter of the Bible, we learn that the God of the universe, he created everything. He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything as an act of love. And scripture tells us that his creation was good. Then God created us human beings as the final act of his creation. The Bible says that he created us in his image. Now that means from the beginning, we were created with dignity and value. Not only that, 
but God created us with a purpose. And so I wanna show you that. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter one, and we're just gonna read verses 28 and 31 to see what I'm talking about. And in Genesis chapter one says this, it says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. Now, I want you to notice something very significant about that passage. I want you to notice that God called humanity to participate in creation. What God was doing here, or what God was saying here was, hey, you're not like everything else that I created. You're special. You have been created in my image. And listen, that's so significant. And as a result of that, you have a special job to play. Your job and my job is to rule over creation on God's behalf. So in other words, God was basically saying this, I founded the company and now I want you to be the CEO. I believe in you. And that's what God was saying when he created humanity. That was God's original plan. But, and there's always a but, we know it doesn't always go that way. Life isn't that easy all the time. Sometimes, instead of doing what is good for others, we just do what we think is good for us. We ignore a friend uh, when they need us. We neglect our parents' advice and end up causing more trouble than if we had just listened. We choose to rebel against what we know is right and instead we do what's wrong. This has been the case since the beginning of time. We as humans are just prone to rebellion. So as we continue in the story in Genesis, I want to show you how it all started. So Genesis chapter 1, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1 through 6, we talk about where rebellion kicked in humanity. And it says this, it says, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat, God's, that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat of it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruits looked delicious, and she wanted wisdom, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Everything was good, right? Adam and Eve were living in harmony with God, with each other, and with creation. But then they chose to rebel against God and the future that he had planned for them. And the heartbreaking reality is that this rebellion wasn't just something that happened way back when in the Bible. This is something that we do almost every day. Listen, we rebel against God and we throw away our future like Adam and Eve did. So why am I telling you all this? Listen, I wanna break this down step by step because I wanna show you if you wanna throw away your future, this is how you do it. Number one, like Adam and Eve, you focus on what you can't do. So listen, if you wanna throw your future away, number one, you focus on what you can't do. Genesis chapter three, verse one says this, did God really say, and the serpent is speaking here, did God really say you must not eat the fruit 
from any of the trees in the garden. The serpent gets Eve to focus on what she can't do if she follows God. And, and this is crazy because she ignored the fact that God told her and Adam that they can eat from all the trees except one. God told Adam and Eve, look, you can eat all day from the tree of Panera. You can eat all day from the tree of Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. You can eat all day from the tree of Chipotle. You just can't eat from this one tree. But the serpent gets Eve to focus on what she can't do. Maybe you have friends that sound just like that, getting you to focus on what you can't do. Maybe they've said things like this to you. You're so judgmental since you think that I shouldn't do this. Or you can't come out with us because you are not allowed to do this or that. Or you can't smoke this, you can't drink this, you can't watch this, or you can't do that with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Listen, here's an important principle. If you're a follower of Jesus, Christianity is not about what you can't do. It's that we don't need to do, it's, not, it's that we don't need to do those things. We don't have to go looking for approval or validation or meaning from any of those things that I just mentioned. That because, because as Jesus followers, we've discovered something so much better. Now we can say no to all those things because you and I, as followers of Jesus, have experienced purpose and worth and meaning and love from God. Look, I know as a teenager, you are told constantly what you can't do, but don't focus on that. Because if you keep focusing on that, you won't grow in your relationship with Jesus. Because listen, when you just focus on, on what not to do, listen, that's, that's not relationship, that's religion. And Christianity is not a to-do list. So step one to throwing your future away. Focus on what you can't do. Step two, if you wanna throw your future away, believe in a lie. Check this out in Genesis chapter three, verse four. It says, and the serpent again speaking, he says to Eve, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God knowing both good and evil. Now this is interesting because what the serpent told Eve wasn't 100% false, but it wasn't 100% true. So you see, they didn't take a bite of the fruit and immediately have their hearts you know, stop beating and die, but they did immediately fracture their relationship with God. You see, God is the source of all life so when we turn from God, we are turning away from, a, from life and turning towards death. Unfortunately though, we so often believe in these lies that parts of it begin to seem true. For example, you prayed for, for that thing and you hear no answer from God. And so here's the lie that you believe. God must not be listening or God doesn't care. Or how about this one? You were faithful to be there for a friend when they were in trouble, but that friend keeps choosing to go down the wrong path. And so here's the lie that sometimes we believe. You know what? You're not really making a difference in their life. So why even help them? Or how about this one? You show up to church and, and you try your best to live for God, but you still mess up. And here's the lie that comes at you. You're just a bad person. So there is no point to trying to be good. So why are you trying to live for God? You see, scripture tells us that the devil, the enemy of our soul is the father of lies. And his main goal is to deceive you. And so that's what he wants to do. He wants you to believe in a lie. So step two to throwing your life away, believe in the lie. And lastly, if you want to throw away your future, give in to temptation. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 says this. It says, The woman was convinced. She saw that the, tr that the tree was beautiful 
and his fruits looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. Eve focused on what she couldn't do. She believed a lie that God didn't have her best interest in mind. She thought that God was, was holding out on her. So she gave in and did the opposite of what God was calling her to do. Now, before you judge Adam and Eve and, and before, you stay, before you say, man, that was that's so stupid what they did, or if I was in their shoes, I wouldn't have done the same thing. Listen, we do this all the time. We're no different. We think we can't do this or, or drink that or go out with that person. And so what ends up happening, we get down on ourselves, we get discouraged, we get depressed. We start believing God is, is keeping something from us. We, we start to believe that, that God is keeping us from having you know, fun. And like Eve, we start to think that God doesn't have the best in mind for us. Then we start believing that we aren't good enough to live the life that God has created us uh, to live. And so what ends up happening? The final step is, is kind of a, is no brainer, it's easy. We end up giving in, don't we? We give in to temptation. Now you're probably thinking, I, I thought you said that, that this message is the greatest story ever told. Like, Pastor G, this actually, everything you're telling me actually stinks. Like, I feel horrible about myself. Well, well, listen, the good news comes nine verses later. And that's how I wanna close our, our message tonight, by giving you some good news and giving you some hope. Because it does give me hope to know this. So here's the point of our talk. Here's the good news. And here's what I'm trying to get at. That even when we rebel, God still chooses grace. Even when we rebel, God still chooses grace. I want to show you that. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, our, our last scripture for the night, and it says this, So the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This was the first prophecy about Jesus. You see, Jesus was the offspring of Eve who would eventually crush the head of the serpent, the devil. And nine verses after humanity rebels against God, we discover God's plan to put back together everything that was broken, starting with us, starting with you. How? One word. Jesus. It says that Jesus will crush our rebellion, but it will crush him to do it. Jesus crushed sin and death on the cross, what we celebrated just this past weekend, but it cost him his life to do it. Jesus died on the cross so that the whole world can have life with God. So why are we still even talking about Easter? Why did Easter matter so much? Why does it matter to our faith so much? Because when we rebel, God still chooses grace. Easter is the celebration of God dealing with our rebellion so that we could have a relationship with him forever. I remember during a season in college, I started to struggle with, with sin in my life. I was doing things that I knew I shouldn't be doing. Now the, the kicker, the interesting thing about this story is that I was at a Christian university studying to be in full-time ministry. Listen, I grew up in church, I went to youth group, and now I'm studying to be a pastor. And, and, and I'm struggling with sin. I didn't, during that time in college, I, I didn't stop believing in God. I just got to a point in my life where I was complacent with my relationship with Jesus. And like Eve back in college, I just started 
to get tempted. And I began to give in. I was throwing away my future. I focused on what I couldn't do. I believed in the lie. I thought I was missing out on life. And, and so I gave into that temptation. But essentially what I was doing, I was, I was just rebelling against God like Adam and Eve did. And listen, I wish I could say that, that when this was going on in college, that it just lasted like a day or two or a week. This went on for a couple of semesters. Now, again, I'm not talking about just sin in general. We all make mistakes every day. We, we sin every day. I'm talking about, and I was intentionally rebelling against God. I knew what I was doing was wrong, and I just kept doing it. When I finally came to my senses, I started to believe another lie. I said, I started thinking to myself, and God's never going to forgive me. Or God, he can't use me now. Like, I'm done. But the good news is that even when I rebelled, God still chose grace over me. And listen, that's why I, I serve and live and believe in Jesus. Not because he has the best advice on life. And, and bar none, nobody can compare to God's wisdom, to Jesus' teaching on you know, finances and love and, and forgiveness. But that's not why I believe in him. That's not why I serve him. You see, I believe in Jesus. I serve Jesus. I love Jesus because he took the mess that I made of my life and showed me love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace, even though I didn't deserve it. Now, as we get ready to close, I want to speak into your life really quick. Where I was during that period in college of rebellion, that's exactly where some of you are today. You're living in the pain of your rebellion and you don't know what to do. You feel like you've messed up so much that there's no way things can get better. But guess what? Today, tonight, Jesus is inviting you to accept his grace even in the middle of your rebellion. Do you remember the story of, of Jesus' crucifixion? I encourage you, if you don't know it, to go back to the story in the Gospels and read um, some of Jesus' last words. Now, if you remember the story, Jesus died on the cross alongside two thieves. And one of those thieves had this kind of breakthrough moment and began to put his faith and belief in Jesus as he was dying on the cross next to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, would you remember me? when you go into your kingdom. Now, I love this story because you see, Jesus, when that thief said that to Jesus, Jesus didn't look at him and, said, and say, or said, you know what? It's kind of convenient now that you're believing in me, now that you're minutes away from dying, now that you're hanging on the cross, right? It's pretty convenient that now you're asking me for forgiveness. But we, we don't see that anywhere in the story. We don't see that, that Jesus rubbed his rebellion and his sin in his face. But if you read the story, you see that Jesus said to that thief that as of today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus offers grace in the middle of our rebellion. Why did Easter matter so much? Because even when we rebel, God always chooses grace. I encourage you that uh, when this video ends, can I encourage you to spend a few minutes just in prayer and maybe working through some of the issues that you may be going through and know that Jesus is waiting to extend his grace to you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Dreams of living
and pray over ourselves and our families. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands. They won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation.
Never gonna let me down.